Bless the children. Today we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel 30. 1 Samuel 30. It is in your new your Old Testament. And if all fails, there is a wonderful table of contents that will help you find it. Hallelujah. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible. Raise your hand if you need a Bible. There's a, a, a young lady over there that needs a Bible. And Sandra, she needs a Bible too. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 30. 1 Samuel 30. We're going to start in the first verse. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm not even there. You know, I used to, when I used to, before I became a, a, a minister of the Word of God, um, I used to be in church services. And I just love the praise and worship. I would just love the praise and worship. And then it's like when it stopped and the, pa and the pastor got up to preach, I was like, no, I want to keep praising him. But you know what? Then I came to find out about how powerful the Word of God is. How powerful it is. You know, the Word of God is life-changing, okay? So, you know, every time, I every time we come to the church, we have to have the Word, hallelujah, into the church house because we, we, have a, we have a life to live outside of this church, right? And sometimes it can be stressful. And sometimes the enemy comes against us, hallelujah. And sometimes there's sickness and there's, you know, bills to pay. And then there's children, teenagers, praise God, to deal with. Um, the Lord knows what I'm going through, hallelujah. So, you know, you, we have to be fed. We have to be fed because we have to be able to make it out there in this world. And still keep our faith and still keep our witness, hallelujah, right? Because we're here to uh, be witnesses for Jesus Christ. So thank you for coming into the house of God. God, we're going to go ahead and start reading. If you are there, say amen. First Samuel 30. Amen. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you been there? <laughs> and David's two wives, Ahinoam and uh, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nebah, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Amen. The Lord his God. Then David said to Ab Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Bazor, where, there, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 stayed behind who were so worried that they could not cross the book, the brook Besor. Okay, so let's go ahead and skip a little bit and go down to 17, okay? You can read that on your own time. That's your, that's your reading assignment for tonight, the rest of that, okay? Say, amen, Pastor, I'm going to read it tonight. Okay? Y'all said it, you got to do it. You can't lie in the church of the Lord. Then David attacked them, I'm in 17, that David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode the camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, or, or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for 
through your word. We pray, Lord Father God, that it will come forth with power, unhindered by any plan of the enemy, Father God, that it will touch the lives, Father God, and change situations, Father God, because that is the power of your word. We thank you for it. We glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Praise God. So what is going on in the story? Let me let me just kind of give you a little bit of background, okay, so we understand what's going on here. Okay, we know David, uh, when he was a shepherd boy, the Lord uh, anointed him to be king of Israel, right? However, during, during this time, there was another king, and his name was King Saul. And King Saul became king. God appointed him only because the, the Jewish people wanted a king. It wasn't time for them to have a king, but they wanted a king. And so God gave them King Saul. Okay, you know, sometimes people, God, we want something from the Lord, and the Lord's like, it's not time. And you know what? I guess if you cry enough, he might give it to you, but it's going to be to your destruction because it was not time. There is a time for everything, okay? So if you're waiting on God for something, just be grateful that it hasn't happened yet because it's not time. Hallelujah. Okay? So, um, so, for, so David, so what happens is King Saul... He takes the throne and he just is, is kind of becomes a jealous of David. He is a man who is very immature spiritually, okay? And he goes from bad to worse. And so he, he becomes very jealous of King David. Or David's not king yet, but he becomes very jealous of him. And so David flees from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. When somebody's trying to kill you, you got to run, <laughs> okay? So, uh, uh, so David flees. He flees to the nation of the Philistines, and the Philistines are enemies of Israel. Okay, so he takes. There's a band of soldiers following him, about six hundred, and so they start to fight for the Philistine Philistines as mercenaries. Okay, so they're fighting with the enemy, basically. Um, so then one day the Philistines go to fight the Israelites. Okay, so they're going to go fight the Jewish people. That's David's people. And so they tell David, you can't fight with us, him and his men, so they send them back home. Okay, so they arrive back to their home, to their temporary home, which is called Ziglag. And Ziglag, by the way, in the Bible, means to be pressed, to be pressured. Okay, so they find that the Amalekites, okay, was a band of, of, of raiders, and they're actually the descendants of Esau. They raided their town, they burnt their homes to the ground, and they took their wives and their children. Okay, so imagine, I mean, this is one of the most difficult situations you can imagine, okay? He's away from his real home, King David, or David. He's chased by a mentally ill king, Saul, right? He's living like a vagabond, you know, from place to place. He's fighting uh, with or for the enemy, okay? And now his own men, we just read it, his own men speak of mutiny by making him scapegoat for their misery and they threaten to kill him. I mean, come on, I know y'all have some problems, but <laughs> you know, King David was in a situation, okay? It's bad, okay? But we know the end of the story, right? And it's victorious. Victory! There's victory at the end of the story, and I'm here to tell you people that there is victory at the end of your story. Hallelujah! There's victory! You know, I know some of y'all are going through some things, but there's victory, hallelujah, okay? So things are looking pretty bleak for David. Wouldn't you say you agree that things are looking bleak? And so, so why? You know, uh, you know, David didn't just fall into the situation. Uh, you know, David had made some bad decisions, okay? One, he was fighting with an enemy of Philistines. He shouldn't have been fighting with those people. They were enemies of the Israelites. God had cursed them, Okay? And secondly, he left his the wife and the kids and, and all the children. He left them without anybody to protect them. Like, really? Okay. <laughs> so he made some some kind of some bad decisions, but that's okay. I'm here to tell you, sometimes I make bad decisions, sometimes you make bad decisions, but I'm here to tell you that God will still give you a breakthrough even though. Amen. Hallelujah. God will make me, even though you make bad decisions and you get into a bad situation. And things are bleak because you made some poor decisions. God is saying, I'm still here. I will give you a breakthrough. I will deliver you from that situation because I'm your God. Hallelujah. Okay, so today I want to look 
and, and focus on three things, three things that David did to get from that place of defeat, right? That place of uh, where something was missing, okay? Uh, something was, uh, there was no victory there, okay? And, and to a place of victory, to a place where he had, was able to get back what the enemy had stolen. And that, by the way, is the title of my message today, Taking Back What the Enemy Has Stolen. How many of you know the enemy has stolen something from you? I, I was both hands. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. But we know that God is a restorer. Hallelujah. So let's look at three things that David did to get to, from this place of, of defeat. Okay, one, we see it in verse six, David encourages himself in his men? No. He encouraged himself in himself? In the police? In the doctor? In the lawyer? No, praise God. He encourages himself in the Lord. Amen. People, God, we have to know that God is on our side. And when we need encouragement, we got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Okay? And sometimes we want to call on people to encourage us. Somebody get that, please. Sometimes we have, you know, the enemy's trying to get in this message. No, I'm going to need this in yours. <laughs> he can't touch this. It's the Holy Spirit in control here. Praise God. Okay? So, you know, sometimes we look at other people to encourage us. But you know what? And, that, and that's okay. You know, you call your sister, your, your father, your pastor, whatever. I'm here to encourage you. But you know what? There is no encouragement like the encouragement that you give from God Almighty. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, so, you know, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I ask questions. Like, I talk to it. It's talking to me. I can not talk back, right? So I asked myself some questions. So I said, you know, it doesn't tell us, okay, how does he do that? How does he strengthen himself in the Lord? How does he encourage? So I said, Lord, how, how, does, how did David encourage himself in you? And the Lord spoke this word to me. There was two things that, that, that David did. One is that he remembered God's promises to him. People of God, you and I, God has made us some promises. Hallelujah. God has given you know God has given you some some of y'all some dreams. I, he gave me a vision for my life. He gave me a dream, and sometimes that's what I got to hold on to, and that's what David held on to. He held on to that promise that the Lord said, "One day you are going to be king of Israel, and your generation is going to last forever and ever and ever, never die." Hallelujah. A lion? 
The king of the jungle? David was a new king. Hallelujah. <laughs> he was a new king. Praise you, Jesus. He, and then he remembered, not only that, he remembered he came against up against a giant. Again, I know y'all have some situations, but I don't think y'all ever come against a big giant. Right, got to kill you. <laughs> he remembered Goliath and what, how God brought him, brought him through that and, and, and gave him victory. Hallelujah. That was a turning point in David's life. That's when the, he gained the respect of the people. That's when the people looked at him as a leader and, and, as a, and a potential king. Hallelujah. It was a turning point. And David remembered that. Oh, God, you brought me through that. Hallelujah. So that's why he encourages himself in the Lord. And secondly, David, and we see this in verse 8. Let's read it again. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him and said, Yes, pursue. Yes, you're going to overtake them. So the second thing was David inquired of the Lord. And people, God, I'm here to tell you that you, if you belong to him, you have him living inside of you. He is there 24 7. Hallelujah. You don't have to wait till morning time to talk to him. You don't have to wait to see him in his office hours. He is there always. And you can inquire of him. Hallelujah. What a good God we serve. I always I've said this many times and I'll keep saying it. God could have chosen anywhere on the universe to make his home. I mean, the universe. He chose your heart. Praise God. So David goes straight to the one who's able to get him out of his trouble. God can defeat the enemy. As a matter of fact, he already has. Praise God. And you know, notice that he didn't go, you know, he didn't call his soldiers over. Come on, let's hug him. Let's, let's strategize. Let's see how we're going to defeat this enemy. No, he didn't. Oh, God, those men were trying to kill him. He called upon the Lord. Praise God. And just to give you a little bit of a Bible, you know, we, we study the Bible when, we, when we're here on Sundays. This is Bible study time, right? Okay, we can, I can preach and yell and holler. But you know what? We've got to get into the Word, right? we got to get deep. <laughs> I like getting deep. So let, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on here. And verse um, here where he calls, he calls, David said to Abiathar, the priest, verse, uh, that's verse 7, Ahimelech's son, please bring me the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So what was all that? What's this ephod thing? Okay, well, in the Old Testament, when the Lord um, instructed Moses to, to, to make the priestly garments, remember he assigned Aaron. Aaron was a priest. Now, uh, he was the, the high priest, the first high priest. And so that's, if I can compare it to anything, I can compare it maybe. He was the highest spiritual leader, maybe like the Pope. Okay, he was the, the highest spiritual leader. Okay, and so he, ta he and part of the priestly garments was this thing called the ephod. It was, like a, it was like a vest that they wore. And on that vest was a breastplate. And on the breastplate, uh, the Lord instructed them to put twelve stones. And each of those stones represented one of the one of the um, the twelve tribes. Okay, there was twelve stones. Then, in on this breastplate, there was always also this thing called the Urim and the Thummim. Has anybody ever heard of the Urim and the Thummim from the Bible? Well, back in the day, and before the Old Testament, remember these people aren't filled with the Holy Spirit like you and I are. We're not filled with, oh, bless the baby. You know, we're not, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit like we are, you know? So they needed somewhere else, somehow, somehow to communicate to God. So God gave them this thing called the Urim and the Thummim. And, and I, you know, studied up a little bit on it. A lot of scholars don't really know. Nobody really knows what it was. They, they think it was maybe like two stones that was put in a pouch and was carried on the breastplate. And if you, you asked the question, and you pulled one out, and with one, if it was a urine, it was no. If it was a thumin, it was yes. They're not really sure. Some think it was they were like uh, they did they, they lit up when you one of like uh, stones that lit up. So they don't really know. But this thing was used to to, to find out the will of God. So um, that's your Bible study. Say thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> so that's your. So, but you know what? But it's just uh, it's just so amazing to me that David, uh, you know, he, he just he was a. 
He was a man after God's heart. Why? Because you know, because he he goes to God. He he seeks God's wisdom. Hallelujah. People, God, you and I, we have to seek God's wisdom. We we, we gotta get along with him. We gotta inquire. When we have a situation where the enemy has stolen something from us, you know what? Don't call the banker, don't you know, don't call the doctor, don't call, you get a bad report. No, no, no. Praise God. Call on Jesus. Seek guidance from him. I don't know whether I should marry this man, you know, or not. Lord, what should don't don't be you know, don't be calling your friend. Oh, he's cute. Marry him. No. No. Marry him, just that man destroy your life. You know, seek wisdom from God. Hallelujah. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. No, that man got another woman out of the time. You know, don't, don't be, oh, 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 Jesus. Seek him. Should I take this job, Lord? No, no, I have a better one. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the job I have. Seek the Lord. And you may think, well, I, I, I don't know. He doesn't talk to me. No, he talks to all of us. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm trying to seek something, an answer or something, and I don't feel like it's rising up in me, I just start reading the word of God, and all of a sudden, the answer comes. And he talks to you, people, but he is always talking. The problem is we But no, I have a church that listens. I'm, I, I'm claiming that. Y'all listen to the Lord. Hallelujah. I claim that over your life. When the Lord speaks, you hear and you obey. Praise God. That's yeah. mm-hmm. No, I ain't, I ain't got a church that don't no obey the Lord and don't know his voice. Y'all know his voice. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so so again, you know, how, how do you see how do you see God's guidance? Let's talk a little bit more about that. How do you see God's guidance? You know, I believe that, you know, David was a man of prayer. Hallelujah. Okay, we you know we get into the word, but we look, but we pray. We pray. You know, David wrote wrote 75 Psalms. And each and every one of them is a prayer to the Lord. You need guidance in your life? Go in your prayer closet. Pray to him. Hallelujah. Seek him out. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's ready to answer. He's ready to answer your prayer. He's ready to give you the right answer. Praise you, Jesus. Okay? Hallelujah. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sometimes we need a word to guide us. We need the word to guide us. Praise God. Okay, so let's get to the third one, and I'm going to finish up here. So David, one, he encourages himself in the Lord. Secondly, he inquires of the Lord. And then the third thing he did, and you know, when I, when I saw this, when the Holy Spirit revealed this to me, because I didn't see, I've read this story many times. It was just like, oh, I wanted to jump up, hoop, and holler, and run. I think I did a couple of cartwheels when I, when I realized he got getting me this revelation. <laughs> Praise God. So, and this is the most important thing that David could have done, and he did it, praise God. And, and, and um, we go, let's read it again in, in 7. Again, then David said to Abiathar the high priest, wait a minute now, David had the high priest on That is the third and most important thing that David did. He took the high priest with him. People of God, we, we of God, have a high priest. And we need to take him with us. His name is Jesus. Jesus. I mean, when I saw that, I thought, oh, David, he had it going on. He had the high priest. And I asked myself, okay, no, well, why, why did David have the high priest with him? And if you read uh, the, the chapter before that, it'll tell you. Um, King, Saul, King Saul was just, he was just a hot mess. King Saul was killing the priest. He, he just had gone crazy. He was a lunatic. He started killing the priest. So Abby Acre ran and he, and he got to David. And David was actually like protecting Abby Acre, the high priest. He was, he, you know, sometimes people have got, we, we got to protect that name of Jesus. You know, well, Jesus will protect his own name, but oh, hallelujah, we got to keep it sacred. We got to keep it holy, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise yeah. you, Jesus. He was protecting the high priest, and he had the high priest with him. 
I'm going to read Hebrews, uh, from Hebrews 4.14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly, hold firmly to the faith we profess. Jesus Christ, people of God, our Lord and our Savior, is our high priest. Amen. What he did on the cross, praise for Jesus to bring us to salvation. That great exchange that happened. Hallelujah. We have a high priest that we can take with us. Thank God I don't have to take a, take a, a man with me. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go over here. Come on, let's go. Over here. Hebrews 7, 23 and 28, it says, There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office, but because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever, therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God. Amen. He lives forever to intercede with God and our Ain't that good? I mean, ain't that good? He's up in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, interceding in our life. Why does he have the right to do that? He took it legally because he died on the cross for you. A sinless man died on the cross for you and for me. And that gave, he did it, he took back. What a picture, he took back what the enemy had stolen in the garden. Do you know that the whole, you know, one of the reasons, you know, one of the other reasons that this happened to David is that the enemy was so upset. I mean, he was so angry with he, with David because he saw that David was a man of God. And I'm going to tell you, the whole Old Testament is about one thing. It's about many things, but it's, there's one underlying thing, and that is throughout the Old Testament, the enemy was trying to kill the seed of the woman. He was trying to prevent Jesus Christ from taking that cross, from dying for, for, dying for your sins. He, he didn't know who the seed of the woman was, remember? Uh, in, in Genesis, God told him, the, the woman's going to crush your head. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head. And so he didn't know who the seed of the woman. He thought uh, it was Abel. So he had Cain kill his brother Abel. And then he thought it was Abraham. And then he thought it was, you know, Isaac. And then he thought it was Jacob. And so on and so forth. And that's why there's so much destruction in their lives. He's trying to kill them. And now he's trying to kill King David because he thinks, surely this is the seed of the woman. But he doesn't know that the seed of the woman was a sinless, raw, oh, sinless, full of faith, full of power. Hallelujah. Man, God, praise you, Jesus. Okay, so let's go on. I'm going to finish here. Pastor, don't be long-winded. Don't be long-winded. I'm hungry. Okay, hallelujah. I just want to read one more verse, and then we're going to finish it out. That's in the same, in Hebrews, the same chapter. Just listen up. He is the kind, and I've been talking about our Savior. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless. Unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus, Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness, but after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made a perfect high priest. Hallelujah. What a beautiful picture of David. David taking the high priest with him wherever he wants. You and I. That's a picture of you and I taking the high priest with us. Forever. Oh, ain't that good that he's working? Yeah, ain't that good, honey, that these people, people, I love the honest call. She's just such a wonderful woman of God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What a wonderful picture that we get to take the high priest with us. Praise you, Jesus. I'm going to finish with the story and then we can, um, you know, anyway, then we'll, 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 we'll move on. Praise God. There was a woman who was a, um, 
who was a will in a church, and she was um, had some financial difficulties. You know, she had problems paying her bills, and and so the priest in the church had heard about this, and so one day he takes you know some money and he goes over to her house, and he knocks on her door, and uh, no answer. So he knocks again, waits a while, no answer. So he leaves. So later in the day at the service, he sees her. And he says, oh, Sister Betty, I went to your house earlier, but you know, I, you, I guess you weren't home because you didn't answer the door. And she says, oh, what time was that about? And he said, oh, it was about noon. And she says, oh, I was home. But I thought it was the landlord coming to collect the rent that I didn't have. Okay. People of God, yeah. so many people, God knocks and helps, and they don't open the door because they think he's coming to take from them something they can't get. But he's standing there with a hand full of blessings. Our high priest is here to give us, you and I, a handful of blessings. And he has, he has already. He gave us new life. He gave us healing for our bodies. Forgiveness of our sins. He took your poverty and gave you his riches. I'm talking about money. I'm talking about money. The Bible, that's clearly what it means. I can, we can do a study on it. He took your poverty. Y'all don't need to be poor no more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So right now, again, I just read. It says, He is able once and forever to save those who come to God through Him. I don't care what the world says about there's many places to get to, to, to heaven. There's many places, many ways to get to Jesus. But only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. So right now, everybody, just bow your heads. Everybody, just close your eyes. Don't look around.